Arrays are one of the most important data structures for any programming language. So let's talk about arrays in Julia today. And to do so, let's use the 2 arrays notebook from the Julia course repository on GitHub. You can run this notebook using the direct link here. I'll put it in the description of the YouTube video also. The most simple definition I found about arrays is that they are ordered collection of elements. And the Wikipedia webpage tells us that it relates to the mathematical concepts of vectors, matrices, and tensors depending on the dimension of the array. So how do we create arrays in Julia? Well, let's start with the simplest example possible, with an empty array. And to declare an empty array, you just use brackets without anything inside it, and it will make an empty array with element types any. And what it means is that we can store inside this array any type of value, float64, in64, strings, or really anything. So this is the most general declaration of an array here, because we don't have to know beforehand or assume the type of the element that we will put inside this array. And it's very practical, but it adds some limitations in terms of computing performance. So the preferred way to declare an array when we know beforehand the type of the elements that will be stored inside this array is to declare it as follows. So to declare a one-dimensional array where we know that all the elements will be of type float64, we use this command. And what it means here is that we declare an array of one dimension with element types float64 and which is empty. And we put this empty array inside an object called a2. And if we ask Juliana what is the type of a2 using the type of function, it returns vector float64. And vector is actually in Julia an alias for an array of one dimension. We can also use directly the ltype function to get the type of the elements inside an array. So if we use ltype on a2, it will return us float64, which is the type of the elements inside the A2 array. And there is actually a shorthand function to make an array of float64. And this is simply float64 and brackets. It also works with other types, such as in64, for example. So now let's complexify a little bit and create an array with actual values inside it. The most simple way to do that is to use brackets and put your elements separated by commas inside it. So if your elements all have the same type here in 64, it will create automatically an array which is of element types in 64. But if you mix the element types, it will first try to promote the elements to a common type, which is float64, for example, here. And if it cannot promote with a string, for example, it will create an array with element types any. There is also a shorthand to make arrays filled with zeros or ones. And for example, you can use the zeros function with the element type, for example, here in 64 and the length of the array, and it will create an in64 array filled with zeros of length 5. We can also use the collect function to make arrays from a range. And this is really a simple example where we collect the values of a range between 1 and 10. So it returns an int64 array with values 1 to 10. And we can complexify it a little bit by adding this. So it will make a range between 1 and 10 each two values and we collect the result which is 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. So you can see that in a range we have the start value, the end value, and the step. And if we remove the step, it will use a step of one automatically. As I said earlier, arrays can have multiple dimensions. So we already saw how to create a one-dimensional array. For example, using the zeros function, we can create an array with element types in 64 and of length 5. But what about if we want to create a 5x2 matrix, for example? Well, you can still use the zeros function, but instead of providing only one dimension, you will provide two dimensions. So here we ask that the first dimension has a size of 5 and the second dimension has a size of 2, which means that we want a matrix with 5 rows and 2 columns. And we can also declare matrix using brackets. For example, if we want to declare a 3x2 matrix with values ranging from 1 to 6, we will do as follow. Each value inside the row is separated by white space and each new row is made using a new line. Or instead of a new line, we can also use the semicolon 
to differentiate between rows. So this matrix is the equivalent of this one. We can also declare arrays with more dimensions. For example, for an array of three dimensions, we will again use, for example, the zeros function with a third dimension here of length two. Okay, now that we learned how to make arrays, let's learn how to work with arrays. We will use this vector and this matrix for all our forthcoming examples. To get the value inside an array, we use brackets to index inside the array. So for example, if we want the second value inside vec, what we would do is simply indexing the vector using the brackets. So for example, here I request the second value inside vec, which is three, which is the same as here. And we can index similarly for arrays of any dimensions, separating the dimension with a comma. So for example, the value six inside my matrix is at the third row and second column. So to get this value from my matrix, I would simply write mat and three for the rows and two for the column. There are some useful keywords also to help us index inside an array. So for example, we can use the column to get all the values from a particular dimension. So in our example, we want all the values in the rows and only the values in the first column of math. And it returns one, three, five, seven. And let's check with the matrix one, three, five, seven. And we can make the same example with the columns. For example, we want only the first row, but the values from all columns, which returns one and two. And if we check one and two, and we can also use ranges. So for example, if I want the values of my matrix on the three first rows only, I would use this range like this from the first row to the third row for all columns. And it will return a subset of my matrix here with only the three first rows. There is also a keyword to get the last value inside the dimension. And this keyword is end. So for example, if we want the last column of our matrix, we would put end here. And if we want the penultimate column, we will use end like this. And lastly, we can also index inside our arrays using booleans. So for example, if we want the second value inside our vector vec, well, we will use an array of booleans with the first value being false because we don't want the first value of vec. The second is true and the two last are false also because we don't want them. And then we can index inside vec using this vector of booleans and it will return three because three is the second value of vec that we get with the true. And please keep in mind that your arrays of booleans for indexing inside your array must have exactly the same size. Well, it doesn't seem very convenient then to use booleans to index inside our vectors or more generally inside arrays. But actually it's a very common practice because it allows us to index with much more complex approaches. For example, here we want all the values inside vec that are greater than three, but we will see those more complex approaches to indexing in another video, right? now let's learn how to add or remove elements from an array. For example, if you want to add an element at the end of your array, you would use the push function. And don't forget the exclamation point at the end of the function. In Julia, it is a standard to use an exclamation point at the end of a function when the function mutates or modify the first argument. And usually when a function is declared with an exclamation point at the end for the mutating function, you also have the counterpart that is non-mutating without the exclamation point. But it's not the case with push. And it is a lot of details, but in Pluto it is considered back practice to mutate a variable. So usually you would use push just like this, push vec, but it's considered back practice to modify a variable in place in Pluto. So what we do instead is to use a begin and end statement. And inside this begin and statement, we copy vec inside the temporary vector called vec temp1 here. And we use push on vec temp1 inside the begin and end statement. If you don't understand all these details, no worries. It's just to remind you that using all this is equivalent to this in normal Julia code, but not inside Pluto. So here we use push on a vector and we add 10. So previous vector was one, three, five, seven, and now we have a new value, which is 10. On the opposite, if you want to remove the last value, you will use the pop function with an exclamation point at the end. So if we want to use pop on vec, it will remove the seven, the last value. And now we just have one, three, five. 
And if we want to remove or add values at the beginning of the array instead of the end, we will use push first and pop first instead. And of course, it's also possible to add or remove values anywhere inside an array using insert and delete at. So for example, if we want to add the value 15 at the second index of our vector, we will use insert like this, the vector, the position and the value. Let's learn how to concatenate vectors now. So it's very simple if you have a one-dimensional array which is called a vector you can just use append and prepend so if you have a second vector with values 30 31 and 32 you would append the values of your second vector to your first vector just by using append and append will put the values of the second vector after the first one so here we have the first original vector 1 3 5 7 and the second vector 30 31 32 for more complex vectors you can also use hcat and vcat for horizontal and vertical concatenation for example we can horizontally concatenate our vector with itself and it will create a matrix like this we can also very easily add new rows to a matrix by concatenating the matrix with a new row vertically and more simply we can also use directly the bracket to make a new array so for example we can make an array with our matrix value and add a new line like this instead of vcat. This is the equivalent of this. We can also reshape our arrays to change the number of dimensions they have. So for example, our original vector vec had a length of 4, so we can easily reshape it into a 2x2 two two matrix. So it will increase the number of dimensions of vec. But we can also decrease the number of dimensions of our matrix, for example, to be just a vector. So we can reshape mat and have one dimension with length 8. If we don't know beforehand the size of our matrix, we can use the colon to take all the values of the matrix inside the dimension. So here, for example, we reshape the matrix into one dimension with all the values and it will make a vector out of it. You could use also the length function to get the length of the matrix or the size function to get the number of rows and the number of columns of the matrix. But this is more the subject of another future video where we will show more complex operations such as finding a value in an array using a function or sorting arrays or doing mathematical operations on vectors or matrices or multidimensional arrays. And if you want more information about arrays you can visit the official documentation here and there is a whole section about multidimensional arrays where you will learn everything i just told you but also iteration or traits or broadcasting and we will get into this information in another video but if you want more information right now you can go there thank you for watching and if you have any questions feel free to ask them in the comments see you next time